Well, first of all, I should congratulate all of you for getting here early, so you have a seat. Uh, if you go downstairs, there's like a mob waiting to get in. Um, uh, so welcome, everyone. I'm uh, Vijay Kumar, Dean of Penn Engineering, and it's just a great pleasure to, to, uh, to kick off the Penda Award lecture. Um, so uh, I don't know if some of you younger people know this, but the Pender Award is one of the school's most distinguished awards, um, a, a great honor. Um, Harold Pender was the first dean of the Moore School, the founding dean of the Moore School. And he was the dean of the Moore School of Electrical Engineering from 1923 to 1949. Um, he's known for many things, including founding the Moore School, which is the reason we're all here. But in particular, he oversaw this project, uh, which had to do with the construction of the differential analyzer, which then eventually would lead uh, to the ENIAC, which of course was a big milestone. So this award is given um, to an outstanding member of the engineering profession who has achieved distinction by making significant contributions uh, to society. Um, and you can just look at the list of Pender Award winners uh, to convince yourself that this is a big award. It reads like a list of who's who. I'm just going to read off some recent award winners. Uh, Barbara Liskoff, Wind Surf, um, Mildred Dresselhaus, uh, Dennis Ritchie, John Hopfield, George Danzig, Herb Simon, Dana Scott, Carver Mead, John Mockley, J. Presper Eckert, and this is only half the names. The others are. so. Um, uh, so today, really, it's an honor uh, to add to that list uh, Dr. Jan LeCun. Um, unfortunately, I don't get the privilege of introducing him. That honor goes to my colleague, uh, Dan Kodicek, who is the director of the GRASP Laboratory. So Dan. Well, it's my great honor, uh, privilege to, uh, uh, to be able to introduce to you uh, Professor Jan LeCun, uh, Vice President and Chief AI Scientist at Facebook and Silver Professor uh, at NYU. Uh, of course, you know, Jan is a household name. Uh, well, at least if your household is a, a robotics, you know, AI, machine learning, data, data science. Uh, so household names, you know, uh, don't need introduction. But uh, and if, if I were really to go through the list, we wouldn't get a chance to hear Jan himself. But let me uh, let me briefly give you some sense of the impact. Uh, I, I just the, the last time I looked, uh, the Google uh, H had already broken a hundred, and even that 2015 Nature paper uh, is is close to 10,000 hits now. I think something like that. So uh, just on on the technical grounds, you know, you know, uh, we've uh, we've got somebody uh, uh, somebody interesting. Um, so so uh, Jan has an affiliation with uh, Courant uh, in the Center for Data Science, Center for Neuroscience, and uh, Electrical uh, Computer Engineering Department. Uh, of course, he, you know, he's, he's particularly uh, known for the deep learning uh, uh, inventions and particularly the uh, convolutional uh, network model. He has a, uh, a diploma from ESIEE in uh, 1983. Uh, PhD from uh, uh, Curie uh, University, 87, postdoc at uh, Toronto. Uh, he went to Bell Labs in 88, my notes say. He quickly became the head of image processing uh, uh, research. Um, and uh, I didn't know he briefly was at uh, NEC uh, in Princeton, and then he went to NYU in 2003. He founded, in uh, 2012, he founded the Center for Data Science there, and. Um, he uh, was, uh, in 2013, he uh, uh, named uh, uh, AI uh, Research Director at Facebook. Um, of course, his interests include uh, AI, machine learning, robotics, um, computational neuroscience, and there's a, there's a long list beyond. Uh, many, many publications, of course, uh, and uh, many, many of them uh, richly cited, um, in, including uh, handwriting recognition. I had a quick look, and I didn't understand the breadth uh, uh, until uh, going through that uh, list. Um, he's the uh, founder of ICLR, the uh, Conference on uh, Machine Learning, recent conference, and of course on many editorial boards and uh, organizing committees. Uh, he's uh, co-chairs of many programs uh, across continents, uh, not just in the United States. Uh, um, 
he's on the board uh, of IPAM at UCLA and also uh, ICERM and, uh, at, at Brown. Um, uh, many companies, many startups. Uh, his honors include just a partial list, uh, New Jersey Inventor Hall of Fame. Uh, he's in the NAE now. Um, he received the 2014 uh, Neural Network Pioneer Award, uh, the 2015 PAMI uh, Distinguished Researcher Award, and 2016 the Lovey uh, Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, many, many uh, more on this list. Um, you know, as I say, if I gave a full justice to the notes I have, then we wouldn't get a chance to hear Jan. I think it would be much more interesting uh, for me to uh, simply uh, thank him uh, for coming, uh, appreciate the uh, opportunity we have to uh, uh, hear about his new ideas, and uh, welcome you, uh, Professor Lacan. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Vijay. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, in fact, a true honor to be, to be here. I, I feel uh, certainly humbled by the by the award. I looked at, at the at the list. You know, I, I noticed that a whole bunch of them are former colleagues from Bell Labs, uh, some of whom preceded me that I, I never met, like Claude Shannon uh, or Richard Hamming, uh, some of whom uh, I met, like Arno Penzias, who actually was my boss's 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 boss when I worked at Bell Labs. Um, and I, I comp compared to these people, I, I feel completely inadequate. But um, but I, you know, I'm, I'm I'm truly honored, and it's a it's a real pleasure. I have many friends here at UPenn, and I've, I've visited here many times. But last time was too too far away, uh, too long ago. Um, okay, um, so I'll um, uh, talk about uh, AI, obviously, deep learning, obviously. Uh, I'll start by a little bit of history, and uh, it might be boring for some of you, but. Uh, there might be some interesting tidbits, and then I'll, I'll talk about the obstacles towards making uh, significant progress in the future, uh, and how could we get machines to learn like humans or, or, or close to that. Uh, but let me start by uh, something a little non-technical. Uh, there's been a lot of inspiration from nature in engineering going back uh, uh, many years, and in particular, uh, a little over 100 years ago, you know, the pioneers of aviation, of course, were very, very inspired by, by birds. But there is, a, I think, a lesson of history there, which is uh, the history of science and technology, which is that w it's good to get inspiration from nature, but it's not necessarily good to actually copy nature, particularly if you try to copy it without understanding. And so uh, a lot of the history of machine learning and AI has been to get inspiration from human intelligence and animal intelligence. Uh, and it spans the spectrum between people who try to kind of keep at a very general level of inspiration and people who kind of try to really copy nature very, very closely, uh, perhaps sometimes without understanding too much. And the lesson I want to I want I want to uh, draw from this here is uh, is about this guy. So this guy called uh, Clément Adair. He uh, in the you know around 1890 he built this actually a predecessor of this plane. Um, that, that was a steam-powered, bat-shaped plane that was steam-powered that took off under its own power. Um, this was 13 years before the Wright brothers. Um, and you never heard of him, right? Like, who's ever heard of Clément Adair here? OK. Are you guys French? <laughs> OK. Are you aeronautical engineers <laughs> or mechanical engineers <laughs> or aviation buffs? <laughs> Okay, um, okay that, what that tells you is that uh, nobody remembers him, okay, for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is he copied nature too closely, and he was a very good steam engine designer. He was an inventor. He invented lots of different things. Um, but he stuck to ins nature, you know, nature inspiration too closely without really kind of having an engineering approach of kind of systematically you know, studying lift and drag and stability and control and building... Uh, models and kites and gliders like, like the Wright brothers did and, and other uh, pioneers of aviation. He just you know, built that plane and you know, expected it to fly. And what, what happened is that the, the plane took off, flew for about 50 meters at about 50 centimeter height, and then kind of crash landed, you know, broke its uh, wing. Uh, <clears throat> and it was kind of secretive, so we only invited a bunch of people from the military to look at it. And so the record is kind of sparse as to whether he actually took off. Um, and so as a result, because it was secretive and because, you know, he didn't have this kind of systematic approach, um, he's not remembered. He had a very little influence. He had one big impact, which is that he named his first plane the Avion, and that's actually the word 
used to, to uh, designate airplanes in French and, uh, and Portuguese. Um, that's pretty much his, uh, his only impact on aviation. He had other impacts, we invented other things. But that, uh, I think what's important there is that, you know, if we try to get inspiration from nature, we have to also understand the underlying principles. And um, that's clearly a bit of the, 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 the trade-off in the history of AI of you know, choosing whether to get too much inspiration or not enough from, from, uh, from nature. So the first, uh, not the first, but you know, some of the early work on kind of uh, brain-inspired uh, AI, if you want, or machine learning certainly, is uh, the, the model called the Perceptron that goes back to the late 50s um, at, at Cornell. And the Perceptron was you know, sort of like the ENIAC or the differential engine. It was not a computer. It was not a program on a computer. It was actually an analog machine uh, that was you know, hardware. Uh, what you see here is uh, Frank Rosenblatt, uh, the, the, the main designer, who is holding a, a module here that contains uh, eight different little modules here. Each of these things here is a tunable weight. It's actually a potentiometer with a motor on it to kind of tune the, the weights. That's how the machine learns, by, by changing those weights. Um, so that was, uh, that captured the imagination of a lot of people in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and it lasted about 10 years. And uh, in the late 60s, people completely abandoned this, uh, this approach to AI and went for an approach that was not at all inspired by biology, uh, based on logic and reasoning and things like that. And that lasted for another 15 years until the mid 80s where Ideas about neural nets kind of came back to the fore. That's what I got into, into the business. Um, so let me talk a little bit about state of the art and kind of the history that led to that. So all of what you hear about uh, AI and machine learning today is the result of a, a particular paradigm of learning, at least all the practical applications with a few exceptions. And that paradigm of learning is supervised learning. Right? So supervised learning is the idea by which you have a learning machine, which is essentially a function that's parameterized, uh, parameterized by a bunch of parameters that you can adjust. Uh, and you, you want to train it to classify, say, images of cars from images of airplanes. You show it the image of a car. If it doesn't say car, you tune the knob so that the output gets closer to the one you want. And then you show an example of an airplane, and you do the same. And you keep doing this with thousands of examples. And eventually, the knobs settle on a configuration that uh, gets all the training images recognized. And the magic of it is that it also works on images the machine has never seen before. And this works not just for images, but for all kinds of different uh, types of signals. So you can uh, you know, do speech recognition. You can uh, recognize objects in images. You can do face recognition. You can generate captions for photos. You can uh, classify the topic of a text. You can uh, translate a text from one language to another. You know, all of this is supervised learning. Um, and what's character what characterizes deep learning is uh, the idea that, unlike the model that was really uh, 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 pioneered by the perceptron, where you, you take the raw signal and you have to basically handcraft a module that will turn it into a form that will be digestible by your learning algorithm. So this is sort of the classical way of doing uh, pattern recognition, going back to the 50s, and it's kind of you know, stuck with us. Uh, until very recently, basically, the emergence of deep learning. And it's still used for a lot of uh, applications of, of machine learning. Um, a lot of the work goes into that, that, uh, that module. And a lot of the papers that you see in computer vision prior to about 2013 uh, basically describe how you do this. Mm. So what deep learning brought to the table is the ability to design a machine as essentially a cascade of modules, all of which are trainable. And they basically learn the task from end to end. So you, you feed it raw inputs, and you tell it what the answer should be, and all the parameters inside are, are adjusted. Uh, it's a very natural you know, idea, but it took a very long time to convince uh, communities in various uh, domains, like, like computer vision, speech recognition, and natural language understanding, that this was kind of a good approach. Um, so it's simply called deep because there are multiple layers. It's as simple as that. Now, what are we going to put in those boxes? Uh, essentially, when it comes down to it, is it's a it's a, it's a uh, multi-layer sandwich, if you want, of alternated uh, operators. So a signal is really, a, you can think of it as a vector uh, or a list of numbers, you know, uh, or you know, a vector with some structure like a 2D image or signal. So think of it as a vector. You're going to multiply this vector by a matrix. The coefficients in this matrix are the things that are going to be subject to learning. Um, and of course, at the output of this, you're going to get another vector. 
and you pass each component of this vector through a nonlinear function, which in modern versions of neural nets are, or deep learning systems, is a very, very simple nonlinearity of this type. Okay? Um, and then you continue, you apply a linear operator again, a, a matrix essentially, nonlinearity, matrix nonlinearity, you can stack as many layers of, th of this as you want, and that's a deep learning system at a conceptual level. The cost function in supervised learning just measures the discrepancy between the output you get and the output you want. And the learning algorithm basically just consists in finding a setting of the parameters that minimizes this objective function when it's averaged over a set of training samples. Okay? So you can think of this as uh, you know, some gradient-based algorithm that figures out for a particular input image in which direction and by how much should I, I tweak all the parameters so that the error goes down. And that's basically computing a derivative of this function with respect to those parameters. Uh, and then you d take one step of that gradient descent on the basis of a single sample. Then you take another sample, tweak the parameters again, take another sample, tweak the parameters again. And when you kind of write this down as sort of a mathematical optimization, uh, that's called stochastic gradient descent. Why stochastic? Because you get a noisy estimate of the actual gradient of the function you want to optimize on the basis of a single sample whereas the function you want to optimize is the average over all the samples. Um, <clears throat> the reason for using stochastic gradient descent and not actually computing the exact gradient is simply because it's much faster. And there's lots of theory uh, written on this. Um, so now the next question, of course, is how do we compute those uh, gradients with respect to all the parameters in the system? And you, know, you have to use the super sophisticated mathematical notion of chain rule. Um, that's about as complicated as it gets in deep learning. Uh, in terms of uh, you know what, what you have to use there, <clears throat> and so chain rule simply says if I know how the output of a module is going to influence my uh, my cost function, so this is going to be you know a vector. So this green vector here is the vector of gradients of the cost function with respect to uh, this vector x i. So it's a, uh, a vector of the same size as as x i. Uh, if I want now the gradient with respect to the input of that module, I just need to multiply by the Jacobian matrix of that box. And if I want the gradient with respect to the parameters of that module, I also need to multiply by another Jacobian of that box with respect to its parameters. And now I can I have all the gradients, and by backpropagating uh, uh, all the way through, I get all the gradients with respect to all the parameters and all the activations in the network, and I can do gradient descent. Uh, the surprising thing about this is that this idea that you can basically use this backpropagation method and gradient descent to train a multi-layer uh, learning system didn't come to the fore until around 19, 1986. And you know, the concepts are extremely simple. Uh, very similar algorithms were invented by control theorists in the early 60s. It's called the Kelly bryson algorithm, or the I joined, uh, I joined state uh, uh, method for optimal control. It just wasn't used for learning. It was used for planning. Uh, but the idea was around. So, um, you know, that's, that's all there is to deep learning, really. Um, <clears throat> now, of course, the next question you can ask is, uh, what are we going to put in those boxes? So if we have an image that uh, basically is, you know, a whole bunch of uh, uh, pixels, you know, that might be several hundred thousand uh, uh, variables, we're not going to be able to multiply it by uh, a matrix and produce another few hundred thousand variables. It's going to be, you know, a matrix with several hundred million entries, uh, possibly more. So that's going to be too much. So we're going to ask the question of how can we restrict the structure of those matrices in such a way that uh, it becomes practical for high dimensional input signals. And that's where biology, again, comes in. So um, back in the early 60s, um, two gentlemen by the name of uh, Hubel and Weasel uh, uh, studied the uh, visual cortex of cats and various other animals, uh, mammals, and figured out that uh, neurons in the cortex uh, a single neuron in the cortex is, co is connected to kind of a small patch of photoreceptors, you know, the co corresponding area of photoreceptors in your visual field. And they basically extract a very simple feature within this local receptive field, something like an edge uh, at a particular orientation. Um, they also uh, proposed another uh, type of, of neurons that they call complex cells. And those uh, cells integrate the activations of multiple uh, simple cells in such a way that when this particular feature kind of moves a little bit in the visual field, the you know, several simple cells are going to be activated, but the complex cells is just going to stay active because it integrates the activations of multiple simple cells. So that was the idea of sort of building a little bit of shift invariance uh, and sort of robustness to changes in the input into the architecture of, this, of the system. 
Uh, by the early 80s, a gentleman by the name of Kunumiko Fukushima, who was working at the NHK labs uh, in Japan, uh, built computer models of, you know, like multi-scale, multi-layer computer models of this uh, idea. Um, and uh, he called that the neocognitron and, and, you know, kind of managed to come up with some sort of combination of unsupervised and supervised learning algorithm that could get this thing to learn to recognize simple shapes, like uh, simple, simple characters. But he, di he didn't have backdrop. So um, when I joined, uh, you know, when I, I finished my, uh, my postdoc in the University of Toronto and started uh, working at Bell Labs, uh, I had the idea of using very similar architectures, but using backprop to train them and then simplify the architecture a lot. Uh, and, I, uh, and that's what a convolutional net uh, is. So there is affiliation of sort of in inspiration from biology, um, but there's also some, you know, good reasons why we want to use uh, uh, this kind of architecture. So a convolutional net is, uh, simply a, a multi-layer uh, neural net in which each node uh, represented by a pixel here uh, looks at a local neighborhood on the input, so it's better symbolized here. So here is the input, here is a local uh, neighborhood, here is a, a set of coefficients, uh, weights, you know, tunable weights that are, that are learnable. You take the dot product of these weights by this input and that gives you an activation here. Pass that through a nonlinearity. At the time we use sigmoid functions, but now we use those ReLU functions. Um, and then you, you take this patch of coefficients and you slide it by one pixel or by two pixels and, and you get you know, another pixel nearby and when you slide it over the entire image you kind of get this sort of what we call a feature map which is basically the result of convolving the in image here by this uh, convolution kernel. Hence the name convolutional net. Right, so you start from the image, you apply multiple convolution kernels here. Initially, they're random. Uh, and then there is this other operation here called pooling, which is the equivalent of those complex cells that kind of integrate the activations of, uh, uh, you know, feature maps within a small neighborhood um, <coughs> uh, using a, an average or a max operation. In modern forms of convolutional net, it's, it's usually a max. Uh, and then you repeat the operation. So again, you have convolutions here applied to each of those things. Uh, you add up the results, you pass the results through a nonlinearity, and what this map does here is it detects uh, combinations of features from the previous layer, which are sort of, you know, higher level if you want. Uh, do this uh, pooling again, and the pooling has the characteristics that it's half the resolution as the, the main map, so that um, uh, uh, basically it reduces the spatial resolution as you go up the layers, and uh, at the same time increases the number of feature types, and so you kind of change the representation from sort of a localist pixels to kind of abstract high level global representation. If you back project the influence of uh, you know, one of those units back on the input, it basically sees the entire input. Um, so I started working on this at, uh, seriously at, at Bell Labs in the late 80s and by the early 90s we had systems that could recognize uh, handwritten digits really well and handwritten characters in general and uh, started working on uh, um, you know, like cursive handwriting recognition and things like that. So this is a, an example of one of those convolutional nets in action uh, where you see the first layer here and the input is being uh, translated. That's the result of the first layer, second layer after pooling, third layer, again a convolution, pooling again, convolutions again, and by the, by the time you get here, the representation is very abstract. So remember, all of the coefficients here in all those uh, convolution kernels are all learned through backpropagation to minimize uh, uh, supervised uh, uh, training error. Uh, very quickly we realized that we could apply those convolutional nets not just to kind of single characters, single images, but we could basically swipe them over a bigger image and have them recognize multiple characters at once. That's an example of that, uh, again from the you know, early to mid 90s, where um, the one particular output here is influenced by kind of a 32 by 32 pixel uh, uh, window on the input. And Every output here is another 32 by 32 window shifted by four pixels. And so when you combine all those outputs and feed them through a post-processor, you get a system that can recognize multiple objects without prior segmentation. That turns out to be very important if you want to apply those things to natural images, because you don't need to do a prior segmentation of objects from the background or objects between them. Um, so this, you know, this thing without any segmentation can tell that you know, this is 3.1 and this is 5.1, this is 5.7 or 3.7, um, et cetera. A couple of years later, uh, we managed to build an entire system that could you know, read checks and things like this. And by the end of the 1990s, the system that was uh, deployed by uh, AT&T uh, was reading somewhere between 10 and 20% of all the checks in the US. Big success. By the time this happened, the machine learning community completely lost interest in these methods. Um, 
in by the, the mid 90s, 1995, 96, you basically could not publish a paper at NIPS anymore uh, that mentioned neural nets anywhere. Um, it had to mention either super vector machines, also invented in the same corridor at Bell Labs by my colleague uh, Vladimir Vatnik, uh, or it had to use uh, some sort of Bayesian inference or Bayesian network, or boosting, also invented at AT&T. Um, so, uh, so there was a whole period between the mid-90s to the early 2000s where I basically stopped working on machine learning altogether. I worked on image compression. I'm not going to tell you about that. And then kind of resumed uh, working on uh, uh, kind of neural nets and deep learning in the early 2000s when I got together with Jeffrey Hinton at University of Toronto and uh, Yoshua Bengio at University of Montreal. And we basically started a conspiracy to try to convince the machine learning community that neural nets actually worked, right? That the reason why they thought it didn't work were not good reasons and that those things actually worked. And so I started basically trying to find good applications for those things where, you know, they might shine. And, you know, I always liked robotics, uh, but I had a sort of platonic relationship with robotics. I never actually built robots until then. And so, <laughs> so I thought, you know, that was the time to uh, jump in. And um, this just, just about the time I joined, uh, I, I, I left industry and joined uh, NYU as a professor so I could kind of reboot my research program altogether. And I worked with a small company in New Jersey called Netscale Technologies uh, on a seedling project for DARPA that consisted in kind of having this little truck robot with two analog video cameras and then uh, have this truck uh, be driven by a human driver who was instructed to drive straight until an obstacle showed up and about two meters away from the obstacle kind of veer one way or the other. And so we had something like maybe 20 minutes of, of, of data of that out of maybe two hours that were connected, collected. And then we trained a convolutional net to map uh, the two images from the two cameras using a convolutional net to the steering angle produced by the human driver. So it's very simple imitation learning. And things like this had, had been done you know, in the past, not using convolutional nets, but using kind of more regular neural nets. This is the Alvin project, for example, at Carnegie Mellon in the late 90s. Um, so <coughs> um, after this robot was trained, uh, it was able to basically drive itself in uh, cluttered New Jersey backyards, uh, including when there is smudge on the window of the camera here. Um, so it's just running in autonomous mode and kind of driving itself um, through these obstacles. We showed this to the honcho at DARPA who said, oh, that sounds really cool. We should start a big program on robotics uh, using machine learning. And that was called the Lager program. And a bunch of people at UPenn were involved in this program because there were several teams that were involved. So uh, I was involved with uh, my team at NYU together with this company, Nescal Technologies. Uh, here, uh, I think uh, Dan Lee, CJ Taylor, uh, uh, and uh, Costas, you were involved too? I can't remember. Um, <coughs> We're involved in this project uh, to, uh, you know, basically uh, use machine learning to kind of drive uh, small robots off-road. And so you can use things like stereo vision uh, to kind of figure out whether something sticks out of the ground. So you have multiple cameras here, and using triangulation, you can figure out if a particular pixel in an image, uh, you know, roughly it's kind of 3D position. So if it sticks out of the ground, it's probably an obstacle. The problem with stereo is that it only works uh, up to about 10 meters. Beyond 10 meters, it doesn't work anymore. So you get things like this, where the image is labeled, but you can't tell if this path is continuing. Uh, so what we did was train a convolutional net using uh, uh, labels produced by stereo. We train a convolutional net to basically uh, do semantic segmentation, which means you swipe the convolutional net over the entire image. You can do this very cheaply. And you, you train it to label every pixel in the image on the basis of a neighborhood around the, the pixel as to whether this pixel is traversable or not. Um, and you use uh, labels produced by stereo, so you don't, you don't need to hand label anything, essentially. <coughs> uh, and that's kind of the architecture of the convolutional net. It gets some sort of high-pass filtered uh, version of the image that's kind of centered on the horizon. Um, and the neural net was running at about one frame per second on this kind of ancient hardware. Uh, there is also kind of a low-resolution uh, stereo vision system. And you can do planning. You, you sort of put all of those in a map centered on the robot, and you can do uh, receding horizon planning to get to a particular goal. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the high speed, uh, low resolution uh, vision system is there to avoid unexpected obstacles when, uh, when the robot turns around and there is an obstacle it didn't realize was there. Um, so you put all of this together and 
then you let the robot lose. You also let a couple of grad students lose to annoy this poor robot. Uh, they're entitled to annoy the robot, and they're also pretty sure the robot is not going to break their legs because they are the ones who actually wrote the code and trained the robot. So, <laughs> uh, so this is uh, Raya Hetzel. She is now uh, head of uh, robotics research at DeepMind, and the other gentleman here is Pierre Semane, who also works on robotics research at Google Brain. Um, so pretty soon we realized we could use the same technique to not just uh, uh, classify the you know, traversability of, uh, of a piece of, of an image, but also to do what's called semantic segmentation, which is to essentially label every pixel in the image with the category of uh, the object it belongs to. So something like road and building, car, uh, you know, sidewalk, pedestrian, tree, sky, etc. cetera. Uh, this is the state of the art as of 2000. 10, roughly. Uh, and so we were getting really good results, and we had an implementation of this on FPGAs. Uh, this is a, basically a large convolutional net. We could run this at 20 frames per second. <clears throat> um, so we wrote a paper. We submitted to CVPR, one of the leading uh, computer vision conference uh, in uh, late 2010 for, two for CVPR 2011. Uh, we were beating the record on three data sets. Uh, our system was, even without hardware acceleration, was about 50 times faster than the best runner-up. Pretty sure the paper was going to be accepted with an oral presentation. Uh, it was rejected by all three reviewers, who said, basically, what the hell is a convolutional net? Um, we don't believe that a method we never heard of can work so well, so it's going to be wrong. <laughs> Essentially, OK, I'm just, you know. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and, you know, I mean, I'm not complaining. I was actually co-chair of uh, CVPR 2006 a few years before, together with CJ Taylor, actually. Um, uh, so, you know, that's the way things, things do. When, when you have a, an idea that's completely out of the left field that people don't know about, they don't have the background, you know, it's, there's no framework to really kind of uh, uh, interpret it. Um, the funny thing is, about three or four years later, you, you you know, you can't actually get a paper accepted as VPR unless you use convolutional nets. You know, <laughs> so that tells you something about the revolution. Um, so around the same time, I uh, maybe a couple of years later, 2013 or so, uh, 14, I, I was starting. You know, talking about this, deep learning was becoming popular, um, and uh, someone who eventually started working in a mobile eye, uh, Israeli company that was working on vision system for cars, uh, uh, saw some of the techniques I was describing in. The, um, uh, semantic segmentation, then started working on Mobileye and told them, like, you know, you guys should try conventional nets. Like, it seems to work really well. They said, nah, you know, uh, probably not a, such a good idea. So he tried it, beat the performance that they had with the previous approach, and now Mobileye was faced with a, an issue, which is that they had to shoehorn running a conventional net on the chip that they had designed that was designed for something else. Um, and they managed to do that. And that's eventually what made it to the, uh, to the Tesla. So the 2015 Tesla Model S used a vision system to drive on, on highway that used a convolutional net trained by Mobileye. Uh, a year later, the two companies divorced uh, for various reasons. And it took about two years for, for Tesla to kind of recover the performance, basically. I mean, using convolutional nets as well. Meantime, NVIDIA also got very interested in uh, self-driving cars. And what happened to them is that they bought the Netscale technology, the company that I, I collaborated with for this robotics project, uh, is now the New Jersey Autonomous Driving Center Research Center for NVIDIA. They also have another group in California, another one in Seattle. Um, OK, so what happened in 2012 is that our friends from University of Toronto uh, in Jeff Hinton's group, Alex Krizetti, Elias Sutskever, and Jeff Hinton, uh, came up with a very efficient implementation of uh, convolutional nets on GPUs. And that had been done before at Microsoft by Patricia Simard and by people at um, uh, Jürgen Schmiedhuber's lab and, and also by us, but they, they were not as efficient. And he, he had a really efficient implementation and trained it on the ImageNet uh, data set, which was sort of a well-accepted competition in computer vision. And you know, got results that were so much better than what people were getting before with other methods that um, uh, a lot of people in computer vision basically reconsidered what they were doing and kind of switched to, um, to using convolutional nets. So, the error rate in the top five, so this is a data set ImageNet with 1.3 million training samples, 1,000 categories. An error is counted uh, in this case if the correct category is not in the top five proposed by the, by the, the system. 
the error rate, the, the record beforehand was around 26%. Um, and uh, uh, the, the Toronto uh, ConvNet brought that down to 16%. And that was it's really a big difference. And then the subsequent years, the error rate kind of went down even further. Now it's basically below uh, human error uh, in terms of uh, proportion of errors. Uh, simultaneously, the number of layers in those networks has uh, kind of increased uh, to the point that uh, you know the, the, the old convolutional nets I was using, I was showing you earlier, had seven layers or so. Uh, you know, AlexNet has, I don't know, 15 to 20 layers, and then very quickly people came up with much deeper architectures, uh, Google Net, which you know came out of Google, uh, many more layers. More recently, ResNet, uh, by Kami He, came out of Microsoft Research Asia. He's now at Facebook. Uh, used anywhere from 50 to 150 layers. What allowed him to do this is to have those kind of skipping connections that basically allow the system to degrade gracefully if uh, uh, layers kind of die away because of uh, the optimization issues. So that allows you to, to train very, very deep networks, uh, and it works really well. And so that's kind of a standard now for, for these kind of architectures. And so that sort of begs the question uh, as to like, why do we need so many layers? People, uh, you know, back in the old days, uh, when I was kind of talking to uh, um, uh, machine learning theorists in particular, you know, they were telling us like, you know, you can approximate any function you want with only two layers. What do you need more? Uh, people working on super vector machines and kernel machines were telling us, you know, we can approximate any function we want as close as you want on any training set uh, with a, a, kernel, a kernel machine, which is basically a two-layer neural net where the first layer is not trained, uh, if, you, if you think about it conceptually. So, um, you know, why do you need layers? And, I, you know, many of us had the idea that, the, you know, you, you had to have some sort of hierarchical representation of the perceptual world because that's kind of a way of capturing the compositional nature of, uh, of the world. Right, so at, at the low level, lowest level, you have pixels. Then you have oriented edges. Then you assemble oriented edges to form simple motifs. You assemble those motifs to form parts of objects, and you assemble those parts of objects to form objects and objects into scenes, etc. And almost any natural signal that you can think of has this sort of compositional nature, and it may be because the world is compositional. Uh, I'm sure physicists won't disagree with this. So that, you know, basically, I think uh, what makes those kind of multi-layer architectures uh, useful is the fact that the, you know, the world is compositional and hierarchical architectures capture this, uh, this compositionality. Um, but there is a problem with those things. So those things have been deployed. You know, every company that works on self-driving car, every uh, web service company that uh, has to you know, process images uses convolutional nets. But there's still a problem, which is that you need to collect a lot of data to train them, uh, typically at Facebook. Uh, you know, we have teams of people who basically label images every day, and they, you know, we, we have hundreds of millions of uh, images that are labeled, and we train those, you know, convolutional nets on those for all kinds of very fine-grained categories and, and everything. Um, so it's okay when there is enough economic incentive for this, but there is a lot of applications uh, for which you either cannot collect enough data, or you can, but it's too expensive for the application. Uh, one example is, uh, um, you know, the medical field, medical image analysis. Uh, data sets are usually relatively small. Um, and then there's all kinds of applications in sort of, you know, environmental monitoring and things like this where, you know, it's maybe too expensive to, to uh, label everything. So, um, uh, so that leads to a requirement, which is to uh, allow those machines to train mostly in an unsupervised manner. That's really where the future of deep learning is, I think where you can train those machines with data that is not labeled, and they kind of figure it out anyway. So here's a, an experiment that was recently done at Facebook, um, which is not entirely not unsupervised, but it's kind of weakly supervised, if you want. Uh, what what the, the team here, which I was not involved in directly, uh, did was uh, take 3.5 billion images from Instagram. And when people post images on Instagram, they, they, they put hashtags, right? They describe the image, basically, by, by, by a bunch of hashtags. So what this guy did was collect the 17,000 most frequent hashtags that correspond to physical objects uh, or physical concepts, and then train a convolutional net on those 3.5 billion images to basically tell us which of those 17,000 hashtags uh, are present, okay, that people would have typed. So it's, a, it's not a 17,000 wide uh, classification problem because multiple hashtags can appear on a single image, uh, uh, but it gives a lot of information to the system. 
you know, a, a large vector with 17,000 entries, basically. And what happens is that uh, when, uh, uh, when, you, when you do this, you, you train this network with this task, and then you chop off the last layer, retrain the last layer on ImageNet, you get the highest performance on ImageNet, the record. So this is another performance measure than the one I showed you earlier. This is the percentage correct uh, top one. So this is uh, you know, how many images the system actually correctly recognizes. And it's 84.12%, you know, and that's a record. Uh, so you know, what it tells you is that there is a lot of you know, possibility of transfer um, uh, from uh, you know, one uh, uh, task to another. Uh, this is, uh, again, um, some more recent work in computer vision, uh, also at Facebook, uh, again, work I'm not involved in, uh, by uh, a team at, in Menlo Park, where they, they, they devised a, a convolutional net architecture called MASCAR CNN, which is trained not just to pick out objects in images, so it's, it's, you know, it's applied convolutionally to the entire image, so you get a map at every location, you have a score for every category, but you also have an image that comes out, which is a mask of the object being uh, being recognized, and so you kind of collect all those masks, then you do some you know non-maximum suppression or some post-processing, and you get results like this. So you show an image, and it tells you there are seven people here. Here are the outlines. There is a baseball bat. There is a dog. You know, uh, there's a wine glass, wine bottle, computers, people, table, uh, backpack. Here are cars that we barely see, etc. You can count sheep. You know. Um, you know, it works amazingly well. It's, it's really impressive. And you can do things like, um, um, uh, you know, identify key points on human bodies and then track them in real time. So this is actually a demo that runs on a smartphone at that speed. So this is the actual video from the smartphone. Uh, and uh, it can do, you know, body pose tracking in real time on a, on a you know, regular smartphone. Uh, it's all open source, uh, so one good thing about Facebook AI research is that all of our research is published and most of it is distributed in open source, so that's uh, uh, one of them. Um, another team in Paris used, uh, uh, we used kind of some of the results here and produced another system that does kind of dense tracking of uh, body parts and can mat mat map a uh, 3D mesh on top of uh, uh, people and uh, do things like, um, you know, change the clothing or whatever. <clears throat> that's called dense pose. It's also open source. Now, here's something that's slightly more uh, surprising, which is that uh, you can use convolutional nets for other things like translation. And um, and again, there, uh, this is a supervised uh, convolutional net system where a sequence of word is represented basically by a sequence of vectors. That's the first layer of the convolutional net, and it goes to a convolutional net. It's a particular type of convolutional net goes called gated convolutional net that can, can do alignments between uh, sentences. Uh, and it can produce the translation from one language to another with you know, very good performance. Um, more recently, there was uh, very interesting work uh, out of the Paris lab also that consists in doing unsupervised learning for translation. That doesn't use convolutional net, actually. Uh, uh, it's more kind of uh, word embeddings, but basically, you, uh, you figure out uh, vectors corresponding to different words depending on their context using a technique similar to word2vec, but it's uh, slightly more sophisticated. And you do this for different languages, and what you get are, um, uh, what you get are you know, distributions of vectors that have different shapes, but you can map them one to the other in kind of a more or less optimal way. And what you get out of this is basically a dictionary for translating without ever having seen a parallel text. Uh, of the two languages. That's, uh, it's kind of amazing to me that you can do this, but it works. Uh, it's particularly useful at Facebook because uh, people use all kinds of different languages uh, to communicate on Facebook. Oops, I'm not sure what happened. Um, wow, okay. So people use all kinds of different languages, um, and um, uh, and we don't have enough data to translate every every language to other every other language. So having a system that can kind of you know exploit uh, unsupervised data to do this actually is super useful. Another thing I should say is that uh, Facebook users upload uh, somewhere above two billion photos on Facebook every day, and uh, 
uh, every single one of those two billion photos within two seconds is being recognized by uh, five convolutional nets or so. Uh, one that sort of analyzes the content for um, uh, newsfeed uh, ranking. Uh, and there is a number that uh, kind of protect against, uh, you know, like violence, pornography, things like this. Um, uh, there's another one that does OCR to kind of recognize um, uh, hate speech um, that's written on a meme, for example, or something like this. Um, so that's, um, <coughs> um, you know, that's very important. Uh, Facebook is kind of built around deep learning now. It, it couldn't function without it. Um, uh, let, me, let me move ahead a little bit. Uh, um, so there's been a lot of uh, noise recently around reinforcement learning. Uh, particularly the combination of deep learning and reinforcement learning for things like games. So it works really well if you want to train a system to play Doom or uh, play Go or play Atari games. Uh, not so well for StarCraft yet. It's very complicated, uh, although we have uh, teams working on this. But certainly for Go, it works really well. Uh, we have actually um, this Go player that was built at Facebook AI Research by Yang Dong Tian and its uh, team called OpenGo, and it's released in open source, uh, unlike uh, AlphaGo uh, from, from DeepMind. Um, we also have uh, good work using reinforcement learning for StarCraft for, for tactical battles and things like this. So, um, you know, reinforcement learning is great, except it only works for games. So if you look at how much time it takes, real time it takes for a system to learn to play Atari games, uh, it's, about, it's about 100 hours of, uh, of equivalent real time game to reach a performance that any human can reach in a few minutes. Um, and, and so, if you want to use reinforcement learning for autonomous driving, I'm sure a lot of people here are interested in this, or for robot control, uh, it's not so great because, you know, <laughs> basically, you know, the car would have to run off a cliff a few thousand times before it figures out that it's not a good idea to run off a cliff. Um, so you can do this in, real, in the virtual worlds because, you know, you don't risk killing yourself, right? You just lose the game. Uh, in the real world, though, you can't really. So what is it that allows humans to learn to drive in about 20 hours of training without ever crashing? I mean, obviously, we're not using pure reinforcement learning that, like, you know, like what, what, what we can use for Atari games or, or Go. Um, and what is it that we're missing? Um, OK, so what are we missing to get to real AI? You know, there are things that, that we can do with current AI technology, and there's a bunch of things we cannot do. We cannot, do. we cannot build machines that have common sense. We can't build intelligent personal assistants. The only thing we can do is build stupid chatbots that you know, may occasionally be useful. Um, you know, um, we can't build household robots. We, uh, we don't have robots that are as agile and dexterous as a house cat. Our, robots, you know, our machines don't even have as much common sense as a house cat. Um, so you know, how, how, how do we get to that? Um, how do humans and animals learn? How do you, they learn so quickly? So if you look at how babies learn, um, they, you know, babies learn a, an enormous amount of concepts, basic concepts about how the world works in the first few days, weeks, and months of life. Uh, basically without being told the name of anything. You know, it's not supervised learning, it's just observation. They can't really act in the world very much. Um, young babies are completely helpless in terms of motor control. Um, but if you, if you show a young baby, um, maybe less than six months old, a scenario like this where you have a little car on a platform and you push the car off the platform the, and the car floats, floats in the air. You know, they say, well, sure, that's how the, way, that's how the world works. Uh, doesn't seem unusual to me. If you show that to a baby after eight or nine months, they go like this. And it's because in the meantime, they've learned about gravity. They've learned that objects are not supposed to float in the air. They, they fall if they're not supported. Uh, so our friend uh, Emmanuel Dupou at uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris has come up with this chart that indicates at what age b uh, babies kind of learn different concepts. So things like gravity, inertia, conservation of momentum, things like that, that are, you know, it's around seven months, and stability and support. The difference between animate and inanimate objects, you know, ar arise pretty early, object permanence, you know, things like that. Um, so we learn this enormous amount of concepts very early on just by observation. And you know, my program for the next few years is to figure out how to get machines to do this as well, to learn basic concepts about the world. So look at, and it's not just humans, you know, this is a baby orangutan. He's being shown a magic trick. There's an object that's put in a cup, the cup is shaken, uh, 
the object is actually removed, but the baby orangutan doesn't see it. And then you show the empty cup to the orangutan. And he was on the floor laughing. <laughs> OK, so, so his, his model of the world was, was violated. Right? OK, his, his, his model of the world was broken. When your model of the world is broken, it can be funny or it can be scary because there's something that happens that you didn't predict. And so that might kill you. Uh, you have to pay attention. In any case, you pay attention because you're going to learn f something from it. You're going to have to update your model of the world from the stuff that, hap that happened that you weren't able to predict. You know, we can predict things like, you know, we can easily learn that the world is three-dimensional by teaching ourselves to predict what the world is going to look like when we move our head. The best explanation for how the, our view of the world changes when we move our head is the fact that the world is three-dimensional, that there is depth, right? So we, we should be able to train machines to learn depth spontaneously by just having a camera moving around. And, and asking you to predict. And that sort of leads, that leads to the, this concept of self-supervised learning. So let's imagine the data that the machine sees is kind of a segment of a video, let's say, right? So you have time here, you have a space. And um, uh, you, you, you tell the machine, pretend that you know this piece. You actually know this piece. Pretend that you don't know that piece, uh, which is like the future, if you want, of, of the video. Try to predict the future from the present and the past or try to predict the top of the image from the bottom of the image, or try to predict the past from just the present, or things like that, right? So there's different uh, prediction tasks like this, uh, which basically consist in uh, pretending that the machine doesn't know a piece of the input, and then using that piece of the input to train it to do the right prediction. Um, <clears throat> so the advantage of this kind of self-supervised learning is that um, you're asking the machine to predict a lot of stuff. Instead of Supervised learning, where you're just asking the machine to predict a label, or reinforcement learning, where you're just asking it to basically predict a value, a reinforcement, uh, a reward. Here, you're asking it to predict a lot of variables at the same time. And what, what that means is that you can train a much bigger machine with uh, you know, your data, you have more data than you can deal with. And you can ask it to, uh, you, you can train a much, you know, very large machine with lots of parameters without uh, running into issues of uh, over, overfitting. Um, so that led me to this uh, uh, statement that you know, in reinforcement learning, the amount of supervision you give to the machine is extremely weak, uh, kind of a, a reward once in a while. Super, supervised learning, it's kind of medium, uh, just a, a few bits of information for every sample. In self-supervised learning, it's a lot of feedback. You know, asking the machine to predict like a whole video sequence from like past video sequence. Um, and that turned into a bit of an obnoxious uh, meme, which, uh, which is the following. If intelligence is a cake, the bulk of the cake is self-supervised learning. The you know, icing on the cake is supervised learning. And the cherry on the cake is, uh, is reinforcement learning. If you measure this in terms of amount of information you ask the machine to predict and the amount of information you give it to predict. Uh, so people working on reinforcement learning usually get a little upset about this. Um, but you have to notice that this is a black forest cake. And on the Black Forest cake, the cherry is non-optional. So you know, self-supervised learning is basically training a machine to fill in the blanks. And maybe that's where common sense emerges from. So the next revolution in AI would not be supervised, that's for sure. I, I stole the concept of this joke from Aliosha Air Force at Berkeley. Uh, and you know, common sense is really this ability to fill in the blanks. So if I tell you. Uh, John picks up his briefcase and leaves the conference room. You don't have to know anything else than those few words to kind of imagine the entire scenario and sort of fill in a huge amount of information based on your common sense. You know that John is a man that he's probably going to stand up, he's going to extend his arm, uh, grab a, the handle of his bag, he's going to walk out towards the door, open the door, get out of the, ro of the room. Once he's out of the room, he's not in the room anymore because an object cannot be in two places at the same time. You know this, you know it's not obvious. Um, it's not going to fly, it's not going to disintegrate, it's not going to you know, walk right through the, the wall. So you know the constraints of the physical world, and that is your common sense, basically. That allows you to fill in those blanks. Uh, you can interpret this picture, for those of you um, um, who have some context. Um, this is President Macron at the end of the uh, World Cup final uh, in Russia. <laughs> um, OK. so. What we need is uh, get machines to learn how to learn, you know, learn predictive models of the world. 
And of course, in control theory, it's something that's very really classical. You have a predictive uh, model that basically you give it the state of the world, a, a command, and it predicts the next state of the world. And you can use this to do planning. That's model-based planning. It's uh, very classical in optimal control in robotics. And you know, uh, in fact, that's what that's why the Kelly Bryson backpropagation at joint system method was uh, was invented to solve. Um, and if you use this kind of uh, generic model of the world f uh, in the context of an intelligent agent, basically you need an agent that has one of those kind of internal world simulator, if you want, that it can use to think ahead about what's going to happen before it happens. So it needs to know to, to have this uh, simulator that can predict the consequences of its actions. And this is our ability to have such a model in our head that allows us to learn to drive without having to uh, kill pedestrians and run off cliffs. Um, because we know in advance what's going to happen if we actually run, a, run over a pedestrian and you know if we turn the wheel so it goes towards a cliff we we have this uh, common sense model that allows us to predict what's going to happen so we can plan ahead to not do that right um, so um, um, so in the end uh, if we want to learn one of those models basically we're going to have to observe uh, a, you know a partial observation of the state of the world and then train a forward uh, predictive model to predict the next state of the world given an action that uh, we're going to take and then perhaps also learn to predict a, a reward if there is a reward. That's just a value of the objective function we want to minimize. Um, and, and of course we can use some sort of supervised running for this because you know, we can observe the next state of the world and so we can train our machine to do the prediction for that next state if we can observe perfectly. Um, the problem with this is that the world is not entirely deterministic. The, you know, if I do a simple experiment where uh, I put a pen on the table and I let go, uh, even if I do the exact same experiment every time, the pen is going to fall in a different direction every time. And so I can't really train a, uh, a predictor to predict deterministically from the past what the future is going to be, because the future might be a set of all kinds of different outcomes, plausible outcomes. So necessarily, if I want to build a predictor like this, it has to have access to another variable, uh, call it a latent variable. Uh, that is designed in such a way that when this latent variable varies over the set, then the output varies over the set of plausible features. Okay? So we have to use latent variable models. Um, and uh, one problem with this is, is that uh, to train this, this machine, we, we have to have some objective function that tells whether the prediction of this machine is on the set of plausible outcomes. Let's call it the manifold of data. Uh, or outside. Uh, and we don't have this function. We're going to need to train this function as well. So this idea that you're going to train two things, a predictor and a function that tells you whether the prediction is good or not, that's the basic idea of adversarial training or generative adversarial networks that, that uh, you've probably heard of quite a bit in, uh, in recent uh, years. And so if your world here is composed of uh, two continuous variables, let's say you have two eyes, each of which has one pixel, um, and that's the, your entire universe, the, your observations. Okay, so each point here is a data point that you've observed. What you want is to learn a contrast function that takes low values on the data points and higher values outside. Okay, let's call this an energy function. Um, and so the learning algorithm is going to have to do things like this, shape this energy function so that it takes low values on the manifold of data and higher values everywhere else. The, it's very easy, of course, if you have a parameterized function and you give it a point to uh, lower the value, just tune the parameters so that the value goes down, very easy. The problem is, what do you do here? Uh, these are points that you don't observe. How do you make sure the energy is higher outside of, uh, of those points? And um, you know, this is a problem that people have, have dealt with in different contexts, with different formulations, in probabilistic modeling and all that stuff, uh, in very different ways. And I've, I've went through a list of seven different categories of methods to solve that problem. Uh, but I'm only going to uh, focus on, on on, on one or two um, very quickly. One of them is adversarial training, which you've, you've uh, just mentioned. The idea of adversarial training is you have this generator. Uh, so let's say you want to do video prediction. And I'm, I know some people here are working on video prediction uh, with Costas. Um, so you have the machine look at a, you know, a little snippet of a video, uh, and you know what uh, happens next in the video. Uh, you feed the snippet of video to a generator, which has access to latent variables that you draw randomly, and it makes a prediction. And initially, the prediction is 
really bad, it's going to be blurry because the machine can do nothing else but predict the average of all the possible outcomes, and that's going to be a blurry image. Um, and then you feed that, those two images to a, a discriminator, which is essentially one of those energy functions, and you train it to produce uh, low values for things that actually occur and higher values for whatever this guy predicts, whatever this guy generates. So you have those, green point, those blue points that are things that actually occur. You have those green points which are produced by this generator, and you train the discriminator to produce low values for blue, high value for green, and so it looks like this. And then you train the generator to produce outputs that make the discriminator produce low outputs. So basically, you make the generator produce uh, uh, predictions that the discriminator can't tell are fake. Uh, and, the, and the generator can cheat because it has access to the gradient of the output of the discriminator with respect to its input. So you know how to move those green points so that they move towards the, the bottom here. Uh, using backpropagation, gradient descent. And so things go like this, and in the end, you get predictions that are better. Uh, so people have been you know, using this for all kinds of applications. There is tons of really impressive applications of generative adversarial networks for image generation, for prediction, for all kinds of stuff, for colorizing images, for you know, uh, uh, learning to segment objects in almost unsupervised manner. This was one of the early experiments for generating non-existing bedrooms. Uh, this is a more recent work by uh, people at NVIDIA. These are non-existing faces, and it's uh, one of those generator models uh, trained to produce, you know, it's trained on images of celebrities, and, you know, we can generate um, images of celebrities more or less uh, automatically. Um, so this works for video prediction. I was uh, showing you just one example. So this is if you train with least square. This is if you train with those adversarial criteria. Um, uh, it works also okay if you train a, a system to like, predict what a New York apartment is going to look like when you rotate a camera. So it sees initially the bookcase here, and it, it, it tries to predict what the bookcase looks like in places it has, hasn't seen. It, it sort of continues this, uh, uh, this couch here when the, uh, when the camera rotates. So it's, you know, it's, it's not seen that apartment before, but it knows something about the organization of apartments. Um, Perhaps more practical would be applications of this for video prediction uh, in the space of semantic segmentation. So this is work done by uh, Camille Coupri uh, uh, and uh, Pauline Luc at uh, uh, Facebook AI Research in Paris and Natalia Neverova. And so what they did was uh, essentially take uh, videos from, from you know, dashboard cameras from cars and uh, essentially train them to predict what's going to happen uh, maybe a half a second or a second or a couple seconds in the future, uh, and what they can um, and, and, and what they predict are maps of semantic segmentation algorithms. So they can predict that when a pedestrian starts crossing the street, uh, it's probably going to keep crossing the street. When a car starts turning left, it's going to keep turning left. It's really good to be able to predict what other cars are going to do if you want to be able to drive safely. Um, and then more recently, we've been uh, uh, in my lab with uh, uh, Michael Enaf. Uh, and uh, a couple other uh, members of my lab, we've been working on a, a latent variable model to predict uh, from video as well, applied to self-driving cars. I'm not gonna, I don't have time to go into the details of that model, but um, essentially um, you get uh, views, top-down views of uh, a segment of a highway. You can track the cars uh, and you can generate images like this. And then you can generate a data set where basically you track every car and you extract a little rectangle around every car. Uh, and you basically tell the system, here is your environment of you, the car. Try to predict what this environment is going to look like a few seconds from now so that I can plan ahead to uh, uh, try not to crash into other cars, right? So you give a few frames uh, of the past. This is me. Uh, my car is blue. And then the surrounding cars are obtained by, you know, LiDAR or something like that. Um, and they try to predict what's going to happen next. Um, and this is the kind of prediction you get. So if you use just least square to predict, uh, you get a very blurry prediction very quickly because the system really doesn't know what's going to happen in the future and kind of you know, predicts the average. Um, but if you train with this uh, technique that I actually didn't really explain called target encoding networks, uh, there is a latent variable that allows you to take the slack that you know, predicts multiple alternate uh, uh, futures, and those are uh, multiple predictions that are obtained here on the right uh, when you draw 
you make different drawings of this latent variable that basically determines what's going to happen in the future. And that's automatically learned by just training on, on videos of this type. Um, so now what you can do is use a, a system to uh, uh, basically do, do planning. I'm just going to uh, show you the one that actually works, where you, you train a policy network. So it's a neural net that from the state, the current state of the environment of the car, uh, predicts a, a steering angle and an acceleration deceleration uh, and it's got this forward model that predicts the, the next uh, you know state of the surrounding of the car uh, you feed that to a cost that you can compute uh, differentially which measures the distance of the car to the other cars essentially and uh, whether it's out of a lane or within a lane you run this you roll out you roll this out for you know a few uh, uh, time steps maybe 20 time steps or something like this and then by great by back propagation and, and gradient descent, you train this policy network to actually come up with a policy that actually drives well. If you just do this, it doesn't quite work. You need another ingredient, which is to uh, use as part of the penalty cost here, an indication of how reliable uh, this guy think his prediction is. Um, and w um, what I should mention here is that you run this multiple times for multiple samples of the latent variable because you don't know what the other cars are gonna do, so you have to kind of predict um, you know, 20 or so possible futures. So you have to include this uh, measure of uh, epistemic uncertainty in the cost we can, you can do differentially and kind of optimize the trajectory this way. And what you get in the end uh, is something like this. So this is the ego car. The little dot here indicates the action that the car is taking, uh, either turning left, right, accelerating, decelerating. And, uh, you know, here it, it knows it needs to be between those two cars. So I have to mention that uh, these are actually recorded cars uh, in a real setting. And these cars, of course, don't see that guy because this guy is, you know, is running in this environment and those cars don't see it. So this guy has to drive as if it was invisible, essentially, which is kind of hard, particularly when you want to merge on a highway. Um, but it, it kind of works. So this is, again, a project we're doing together with NVIDIA uh, Research Lab at, uh, in New Jersey. Okay, I want to conclude. I'm probably way out of time. Um, and just uh, show you one little kind of cosmic um, uh, conclusion, if you want, which is that um, in the history of science and technology, it's been the case often, not always, but often, that engineers have invented artifacts and that scientists have come later to explain how these artifacts works and what its limits are. So, for example, the telescope and the microscopes were invented before optics was actually figured out, uh, like way before. Uh, the steam engine was invented and thermodynamics was actually devised to explain the limits of steam engines. And thermodynamics became one of the most important intellectual constru constructs of, uh, of modern science, um, explaining way more than just steam engines. Uh, aerodynamics, of course, you know, was developed earlier than the airplane, but most of it actually was developed afterwards, certainly uh, things like stability and things like this, right? Uh, computer science didn't exist before calculators. Uh, I mean, if there is a place where you know this, it's here, right? I mean, the ENIAC was uh, built, uh, you know, before computer science was a science. Um, and another uh, recipient of the Pender Award, uh, Claude Shannon, uh, devised information theory, certainly after telecommunication, radio communication was invented and people started talking about, you know, machines that could communicate. And so, it's often the case that you know, conceptual construct theor theories that become very important are developed after technological uh, inventions. And one thing I'm, I'm wondering is whether the fact that we are making progress towards building intelligent machines will lead to a science of intelligence that we currently don't have. Uh, and uh, you know, if uh, uh, you know, the end of my career is coming fast, but, um, but I, one of the big programs in my research would be to perhaps uh, uh, you know, make progress towards that goal, not just building intelligent machines, but also understanding intelligence. And that would include machine intelligence as well as human intelligence. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jan, for that wonderful talk. We have time for questions from the audience. Yes.
So there are several uh, communities. There is uh, a cognitive scientist or cognitive neuroscientist who are kind of you know, one step below psychologists, if you want. Like they're more interested in how the brain actually learns. So Emmanuel Dupou that I mentioned, Stanislas Dehaene, who is another uh, cognitive neuros neuroscientist, uh, they are very interested in you know, the stage by, uh, through which uh, uh, you know, young humans essentially learn those concepts, the concepts of quantity, for example, uh, language, things like that. Um, they are very interested by research like this because they need models, essentially. At a slightly lower level, uh, until fairly recently, in, in psychophysics and in uh, visual neuroscience, the, the dominant model of how the brain recognizes shapes is template, was template matching. Um, so <clears throat> the idea that somehow you have you know, multi-layer feature extraction and things like that and invariance, you know, that, that people were, of course, realized that this was the thing that uh, eventually was, uh, uh, you know, was, was going to be kind of et established. But in terms of uh, theories that was operational for like measuring the performance of the human visual system, for example, uh, the ideal observer was basically a template matcher. And so there's been a bit of a revolution there uh, in both psychophysics and neuroscience, visual neuroscience, where now the dominant model that people have in their mind to explain the experiments is basically a convolutional net. Now, the sad thing is that people haven't built convolutional nets that are sort of anatomically correct, if you want, or, or at least even like remotely anywhere close to, to what the, even the sort of foveal uh, part of the visual cortex is doing. Uh, so I think that that's going to take, uh, you know, some more time. Uh, but there is a big influence, I think, uh, which is great because there's been a big influence of neuroscience on, uh, you know, control nets, neural nets, etc. Uh, and, and, and now there is sort of a bit of influence in the other direction, which, you know, I think is great. I, I, I talk to neuroscientists all the time. Right, so the question is about causal inference. Uh, can deep nets, uh, you know, have causal inference capabilities that, for example, Bayesian uh, models have? Um, you can use a deep net as a component in a Bayesian inference system. So yes, the answer is yes. Uh, you know, a, a, a Bayesian network, for example, in the context of, for example, a factor graph is, is basically a bunch of variables that are linked by energy terms that are additive if you're in the log domain, multiplicative if you're in probabilistic domain. But uh, in the end, you know, inside of those boxes, you can put a whole neural net if you want that measures the you know, difference between two images or something like that, right? So um, there is no opposition between uh, Bayesian inference and neural nets. You can use neural nets in the context of a Bayesian inference system. Now, just a Bayesian network is not sufficient to do causal inference. You, you, and there is very interesting work uh, by uh, uh, Bernard Shulkoff and a bunch of other people. Leon Boutou, is, who is at Facebook AI Research, David Lopez Paz, who uh, has worked with Bernard Shulkoff, who is now at Facebook AI Research in Paris, on causal inference uh, using neural models, and also using models that do not require to actually perturb the variable. So the, the only correct way to establish causality is you perturb one variable and you see what the effect on the other variables are. Uh, but in fact, there are situations where you can establish causal relationships without actually having to perturb, and that's really very interesting. Your agenda were um, explaining biology would be you know, particularly um, wonderful to be more bio-inspired, but uh, suppose your, your, your agenda is to uh, build artificial systems that perform. Is it worth trying to put physics into the nets? That we, actually, we actually know something about the real world, but in some of the learning community, there's a, a deep allergy to uh, anything other than end-to-end, -end, uh, you know, let's call it a religious end-to-ender. Okay, so I think there's two, there's two different things that are orthogonal. One is the idea of end-to-end, -end, and I'm a you know, big believer in end-to-end. -end. I'm, I'm an end-to-ender, yes. End-to-end uh, uh, -end aficionado. And then there is an orthogonal direction, which is the, you know, the aficionados of tabula rasa. Basically, I can learn from scratch end-to-end -end without any structure, and that I don't believe in. In fact, convolutional nets are a counterexample of this, where you put a little bit of structure, very, very little structure, a little bit about, in fact, the physics of, of, of images in some ways, the fact that uh, 
you know, nearby pixels in an image are correlated and that the statistics of images are uniform uh, and therefore convolutions is kind of a natural operation to perform. Uh, you can actually write this mathematically and show that it's the right thing to do. Uh, so in that sense, I'm very much in favor of structure. Uh, but my philosophy is to kind of minimize the amount of structure that you, that you put in for the amount of data you have. So if you want your system to learn really quickly with very small amount of data, um, you need to put more structure than you otherwise would. Uh, and the history of pattern recognition over the last 50 years is a history by which uh, data sets have increased in size and the role of prior structure has diminished as a consequence. Uh, so now uh, speech recognition systems are basically large convolutional neural nets and trend end-to-end -end to go directly from raw signal to character sequences. I mean, it's amazing, right? Uh, whereas just a few years back, you know, you had to have like an acoustic model, like a pre-processing, an acoustic model, a uh, you know, Markov model, a language model, blah, 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 uh, and train all those things separately and then have a little bit of fine tuning, a lot of handcrafting in it. Now it's just a, it's just a big neural net end-to-end -to, -end to characters. It's, and it, it's state of the art. It's, it's amazing. You know, computer vision systems, right? Convolutional nets, it's pixels in, categories out, or even uh, semantic segmentation maps out. There's a little bit of structure in it, right? It's I guess critical. I was trying to emphasize the physical world. That you, right, you, okay. Most, mostly what you seem to be interested in is moving out of the information world into the physical world. Yeah. And in the physical world, as you pointed out, there's much less data, much less data. And the data that you get is the data that you perform experiments to get so that you're actually solving the whole problem of time and frozen loops. And I'm wondering if the necessity of physics does become much sharper, uh, partly, partly to reduce that ratio that you were talking about, right? And then right. So the question, I guess, is what counts as data? So in my, in my humble opinion, I think the, when we observe the physical world, so the experiments I was describing with, with children, there's actually a huge amount of data, right? We're sort of bombarded with everything about the world, you know, to the limit of the bandwidth of our, of our, you know, of our senses. Uh, so it's a huge amount of data, in fact, that we have. And the reason why it can be big is because uh, we don't need anybody to tell us the name of everything, right? It's just raw data. Uh, there's a, a huge amount of uh, internal structure to that data that includes physics. Uh, so you know, uh, you know the, the fact that you know objects uh, fall, you know, uh, according to certain trajectories, etc. Uh, that's an enormous amount of data. So I think we should exploit that data and and learn physics to the extent possible. And to the extent that it's not possible, then hardwire some of the stuff that we know about it, right? But but if you start to hardwire things, every hypothesis that you put in the system. Uh, has some probability of being wrong on some part of the data set because you make a hypothesis that may not be true everywhere. And so it limits the ultimate performance. So it's a trade-off. I had a philosophical debate with uh, a cognitive scientist called Gary Marcus on this uh, at NYU. He's, uh, he's from the kind of Chomsky school of psychology and think you, know, you need a lot of structures and deep learning is doomed to failure because people are kind of too much in the tabula rasa end of things and we kind of debated it's, it's, on, it's on the web if you're interested. Okay, let me segue from that end-to-end -end discussion to try to bring this to an end. <laughs> okay. um, we've kept you here long. Uh, for, for I kept you here long. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, we'll have a reception downstairs where all of you who are waiting to ask questions will get to engage Dr. Lacoon in more extensive discussions. But I want to bring this to the end and as we end this, I want to present to you uh, the Harold Pender Award. Next time somebody gets up to introduce you, their introduction will have to be at least one line longer than right. Than <laughs> so this is the Harold Pender Award presented to Jan LeCun for pioneering contributions in the development of deep convolution neural networks, September 19, 2018, Penn Engineering. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So again, we have a reception downstairs. Uh, those of you who lined up. Early